are for us and not against us, Lord. It's your presence, Lord, that changes everything and makes this world possible to endure, Lord. We love you and we praise you. Now speak your words this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So as with everyone, I'm sure that Mark and Laura and what they're going through, losing Zach has been heavy in our hearts. And when Nathan called me, the first thing I thought of was a teaching that Mark taught, I don't even know how many years ago. I think it was a Wednesday night. I don't know how many of you were here, but he taught on Count It All Joy. And the minute Nathan asked me to speak today, and we were talking about Mark and Laura and Zach, and those words kept going through my mind and my spirit. I'm like, Lord, and I, I even asked Nathan, I'm like, Nathan, I keep hearing Mark say, count it all joy. How on earth is he able to do that right now? I heard him saying it over and over. And, you know, and then it, ironically, I heard Ron. Ron said something to me. We're talking, Nathan and I are talking, and I heard Ron's voice. Ron said something completely unrelated. He said, Suzanne, the spirit is always right now. It's not yesterday, it's not tomorrow. The spirit is always right now. And I think that's the key, is that we are so easily brought back to yesterday or brought so easily forward to worrying about tomorrow that we lose the power of right now. The spirit, our God is I am, he is always right now. He's not a moment ago and he's not a moment from now. He is right now. And when we are right now, when we can stop, it takes discipline. It is hard to stay in the right now. But as mature believers, I believe that is what he's saying. And Ron, that's the key. How on earth can we count it joy in the worst of what we go through in this life? But when we choose to stay in the right now with our Lord, that is the only way that we make it through. And so today I want to start in James 1, uh, verse 2. It's the scripture that Mark shared all those years ago on that Wednesday night. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. And diverse temptations, diverse means encamped all around. Like you are surrounded. And temptations is everything from, from trials or troubles or challenges or just the stuff that life throws at us. And the temptation, I believe, is to worry, is to fear. The temptation is to be distracted from who our God is. Not just to who he is, but who he is in us and who we are. Because when we stay connected with him, we are in the right now. Why? Because God is right now. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and everything in between. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. He is omniscient, all-knowing, and omnipresent, always present. He is the great I Am, always present and always in the present tense. And when we are present in this moment with our eyes on Him, with our hearts and our eyes and our ears open to see and to hear, what is the truth of eternity? Then in that moment, we step outside of time ourselves into eternity and into the kingdom of God. And that is where the power of the spirit lies. Isaiah 43, uh, verses 18 and 19. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the dark in, in the desert. Second Corinthians 5:17. That was his promise to bring Jesus who made us a new way. The Lord gave us a promise all those years ago through the prophet Isaiah saying, "I'm going to do something new, and it's going to be wonderful, and it's going to make a way where there seems to be none." And then as believers, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Not becoming, not became. Every moment that we are in Christ is right now new. 
right now. New. New has no sickness. New has no disease. No, new has no fear. New has no tarnish. New is new. New is perfect. When it's new, it is perfect as it was, uh, as perfect as it was ever created to be. In Galatians 2.20, and this verse is one of my life verses, and I feel like in this mindset, in this perspective, I feel like it just takes on a whole new meaning. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How can I be walking around and say, it's not me, but it's Christ who lives in me. Because when I live in the moment right now, there is no difference between Christ and me. We are one. We are one in the moment. When I have my heart and my mind and my spirit connected, and I'm in the present moment, I am no longer living. But Jesus Christ lives and walks and moves and has his being in me. His hands are my hands. His feet are my feet. His words are my words. And that is where the power of the Spirit lies. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love with where he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit. Again, present tense. We're sit, not sat, not sitting. We're sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. There is exceeding riches in sitting at the right hand where we are right now. It sounds so simple. It's almost cliche. We hear it all the time. There's a, a whole movement in the whole yoga meditation movement right now. Be present. Live in the now. These are phrases that I hear all the time, even at work. And I'm not even joking about this. I went through a leadership development class where they hired a grounding expert to teach us at the beginning of every leadership development training we went through to how to be present. It was literally 10 minutes. They hired someone's job, someone's profession is to teach people how to live in the moment and be present. And we went through 10 minutes of focused breathing, controlling, disciplining our minds. And it was ironic because I was like, a lot of people felt uncomfortable. I'm like, this is like prayer. This is like meditation. Like as Christians, it wasn't something new, but to do it in a work setting was very bizarre. But the world is figuring out where the power is. The power is in right now. And I was like, a ground, I guess I'm a grounding expert. I guess as Christians, we're grounding experts because we know how to live in the present. Um, and so, it, yeah, it wasn't much different from biblical meditation. It was the same as being quiet in the Lord's presence or focusing on that one scripture or that one aspect of God that just has your attention and your heart in that moment. But in this world, if we don't carve out time, if we don't set aside that quiet time Timmy talked about this morning, if you don't purposely and intentionally make time out of our busy lives, it's difficult to, to just in the moment, right? When you're in the moment, it takes discipline, it takes focus, and it takes intention. But it is the most powerful tool that we have to keep us in the present and in the now. And what it does is it, it's almost like it builds that, that connectivity, that pathway for your whole day. And it's almost like, I, I always feel like it just lays the bricks that you're going to walk on for the day, right? It just, it lays it out. Whatever the thought is, whatever the scripture is, you're going to meet someone that needs to hear it. You're going you're gonna to talk to someone where it's going to come up in conversation. And have you ever noticed that when you're really present with the Lord, whether in worship or in prayer or in quiet meditation, that in those moments when you are living in the right now, there's no worry, there's no guilt, there's no pain, there's no sickness, there's no thought of lack, there's no troubles, there's just peace and love and joy in the Holy Ghost. And that is because in those moments we step, we step outside of this world, we step outside of time into the kingdom of God where none of those things exist. The kingdom of God is always right now. The kingdom of God is not yesterday. The kingdom of God is not tomorrow. It's just right now and now. 
and now. And it's always now. And with abiding in the spirit in the now comes all of the gifts and the fruits of the spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I, I helped Michael out today. I loaded all the scriptures ahead of time. So I'll be going a little faster. But um, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit is, right? Everything is. I've never noticed this before, but everything when God is talking to us is present tense. All of the scriptures are written in present tense when they're speaking to us about the spirit. Uh, Galatians 5.25. Galatians 5.25. And if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Uh, okay, so it's two different things, right? Walking is carrying it with me. Living in it is easy, right? I can go and plunk down and I can, I can have a consciousness, but to walk and do the things throughout the day and to still walk in the spirit, that's the trouble. That's, the, that's where the mature believer has to focus. I can live in the spirit, but when I get in the world, how do I walk in the spirit, right? It's different. And has anyone seen the movie National Treasure where they find that map and then they get those glasses and they flip, there's like all these different lenses and they flip the lenses and every time they flip a lens they can see a new part of the map. It's like holographs and it's this fancy map, you know. Um, I feel like stepping out of the old and into the new or into the now, right? Now is always new. New and now are exactly the same thing. It gives us that new perspective. It shows us something else on the map. It shows us something different in the scriptures. It shows us things from God's perspective, and it illuminates a whole other thing. It was like literally when the, when, when, I did, when the two things counted all joy and the spirit is right now, when those two things came together, it flipped a lens. And then all of a sudden, I'm reading all these same scriptures that I know, but suddenly they mean something different. 2 Corinthians 4.18 I love that, by the way. It's like those moments where you get that light bulb or it's like something just illuminates. And all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh. And it's so funny to me because all those years ago, Mark said those words, count it all joy. And I have carried that as one of those little nuggets of truth. Anyway, um, so 2 Corinthians 4.18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are not are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. We are so stuck in our humanity so often because we see the things around us, we feel the things in our body, and we are so convinced that that is the truth. We're convinced that that's all there is, that that's, that's it. And it's not. This is the temporary. This is the stuff that the, this is nothing but move, this is, sound. At the, at the very foundation of it, this is something that was spoken to existence. I mean, everything is not as it appears. And I know I say that all the time, but things are not as they appear. Hebrews 11.1. 1. But when we think about the things that are eternal, and we speak those things that are eternal, and we believe those are the things that become. We bring those out of the kingdom of God into the natural world. And we can see them. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How can you have evidence of something you can't see? Because I have a truth. I have something that is so, I am so confident and it is so real to me that I don't need to see it with my own eyes. That's how convinced we have to be that I don't need to see it with my own eyes. I know it's true. I trust God implicitly. I know that he is for me, not against me. I know that he is my healer, that by his stripes I was healed. I am so convinced that that is true. I don't need to see it with my own eyes. To be fully convinced and believe and walk out my life and my words and my mind will always show the evidence. I can't say I'm there yet in every area of my life, but that's what we're called to. To be so convinced that we don't need to see it with our own eyes. And it is the greatest trick of the enemy, the greatest scheme that he has to get us stuck thinking about the past or worrying about the future. That takes us immediately right out of the now. Sickness and disease make us worry about our future and how many days we have left, right? We have pain in our body. 
Death makes us think about what we've lost, what we once had that we don't have anymore. But when we choose to live in the now, in the new, in eternity, there is only life and life forevermore. As hard as it is to lose the people that we love, it's just for a little while. It's just temporary. We didn't lose anybody that we love. We're going to see them again. 1 Peter 5, 8. But our enemy wants us to con convince us. Oh, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. You just wait. You just watch. The little, still that little voice in the back of your head. But he's a liar. He is a liar. All he can do is lie. He has no power except to lie to us. That's his only power. And he uses our own minds. He uses the people we love, that we, that we want the best for. He uses all kinds of situations to lie to us about what is truth and what is not truth. Be sober and be vigilant. Always on watch. We cannot let our guards down for a second because he is right there waiting to whisper in our ear to give us a new worry or a new thought. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion. He's talking. He's not biting. He's not hurting. He's talking. He's talking a big, loud, scary game. A lion, when they roar, is scary. But it's when they bite, it hurts. It doesn't hurt when they roar. It hurts when they bite. He's not biting. He has no teeth. The Lord has removed this lion's teeth out of his mouth. But he is walking about seeking whom he may devour. How does a lion with no teeth devour anybody? He whispers in our ear and we devour ourselves. He lies to us and tricks us into thinking that something is real that is not. Um, John 8, 44. And, any, and, and it's subtle. He knows the scriptures, right? He even tries to use the scriptures on Jesus. He's subtle. But if we know the truth, we immediately know in that moment it's not truth. It's not what the word of God says. You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him, the devil. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. He is the father of all lies. And I refuse to listen to his lies anymore. John 10:10. 10, 10. That thief, the devil, cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I am come that you might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. James 1, 2 again. So when we are encamped all around, coronavirus, accidents happening, people we love tragically dying, suddenly losing our youth, when these things happen, when we're encamped all around, the temptation is to worry, to say, oh, what if this happens? Oh, you know this, oh, that. To speak our worries, not to speak the truth of God. And I like the Passion Translation is one of my favorite new translations. And Passion translates first, uh, James 1, 2 like this. Well, it's actually 2 through 4. My fellow believers, when it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. For you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure all things. And then as your endurance grows even stronger, it will release perfection into every part of your being until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. I don't ever pray for patience. I learned very early as a Christian that when you, pay for patience, when you pray for patience, you get trials. Because it's the difficulties that teach us patience. Because we don't always see everything change the moment we want to see it. When you're enduring it, that's, that's, it's hard, that's the hardest time, right? But there is a place in the spirit where this whole world really loses its pull. It loses its ability to pull us out of our position seated at the right hand. We must remember and not be surprised that in this world we will have tribulations. They come. But we are told to be of good cheer for Jesus has overcome the world in John 16, 33. These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We must remember that we are never alone. 
we have to remember that things are not as they appear in the world around us. What we see is temporary, but God is eternal. He will never leave you and he will never forsake you. God is for us and who can stand against us? And Elijah, I think, had the best example of this. My favorite story of things not as they appear. It's from, uh, I'm sorry, Elisha, not Elijah. Second Kings 6, 15 through 17. Elisha is on a, like a mountain, like a hill, and his servant is freaking out because all they see is the enemy all around them. But God opened his eyes to show him what was really happening. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? Where, what are we going to do? And, and Elisha answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with our enemy, with them. 17? Oh, did I not say 17? Sorry. Second Kings. Oh, sorry. Um... And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. We need to remember that our God is for us. And the heavenly hosts, the angelic armies are at our beck and call. There is nothing I am so convinced that God knows the number of our days before we're ever born. Tim read the scripture this morning. He knows our beginning and he knows our end and he knows everything in between. There is nothing that anybody can do to take us out one moment earlier than what God has planned for us. We are predestined. And there's nothing anybody can do to take us out before it's our time. And Paul, he taught us to speak, the word, to, speak to the Lord when we're struggling and to understand the distractions that plague us. Not to complain or to give up hope, but to receive the grace to continue running the course set before us, focused on his strength, on the Lord's strength within us. 2 Corinthians 2, 9. I'm sorry, 12, 9. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Three times Paul went and asked the Lord to take the thorn out of his flesh. There was something. Some people think he was blind. That's no little thing. That's kind of a big distraction. If you can't see with your eyes, that's a big distraction. And that was a thorn in his flesh. I don't know if that's what it was, but that's what some people think. And he went to the Lord three times. He said, Lord, take this away. He knew that God could heal him. But God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Why are you thinking about your eyes? You don't need your, you don't, we don't even need our eyes to see. I think that's one of the messages, right? We don't need our eyes to see the truth. We don't need our eyes to see into the spirit. Our eyes don't work in the spirit anyway. And Jesus, right? Jesus taught us to look for joy that lay in his finished work at the cross, confident that we will be with him and each other for all of eternity. And that is what gets us through the most difficult of times. Hebrews 12:2. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. If Jesus can endure the cross, right? They're not asking us to, he's not asking us to endure the cross. He's asking us to trust him. To trust him in the most difficult of times when we just let it all go, lay it all down, and trust in him, he will get us through. Life is short, friends. We don't know the number of our days. We don't know how many days we have ahead of us. We don't know how many more mornings there'll be to rise with the sun. James 4:14. 4, but we worry. We worry what tomorrow brings all the time. Those thoughts, sometimes they're not even like big worries. They're just little worries, just thoughts. I'm a planner, right? I call plan planning is a form of worrying. Does it really matter what we're having for dinner on Friday when it's Sunday? I don't know, but I'm always thinking five steps ahead. That's just my personality. I'm always thinking ahead, thinking ahead, thinking ahead. But when I do that, I forget to set out what we're having for dinner tonight, right? Because I'm worried about the whole rest of the week. And if I'm not thinking about today and worried about today, right? Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. We don't know what tomorrow holds. 
For what is your life? It is even a vapor, a moment that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. As sons and daughters of God, we are called to live lives filled with joy. So why not focus on being present and finding the joy in every moment we have in every situation? There are moments that it is so difficult to find the joy, but it is there. It is always there because God is always there. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. And where he is, there is fullness of joy. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversations be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will not leave thee nor forsake thee. Psalm 16, 11. Psalm 16, 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. He is always with us. Joy is essential for us as believers. It's what it takes for us to get through some of these days that we have as believers. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Nehemiah 8.10 Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the, Lord, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's the joy of the Lord. It's his joy that is our strength. And every moment that we are connected with him, we tap into that strength. Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope, hope is what gets us through to the next day, right? Because we are secure in our hope. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. He fills us in those moments in his presence. He fills us with that joy and that peace. John 17, 13. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus wants his joy fulfilled in us. Philippians 4, 4. Philippians 4.4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice is another way to say rejoy. Joy, joy, again and again and again and again. Rejoice, rejoice. It's all through the songs. Sing for joy, rejoice, sing for joy. Rejoice again and again, joy again and again. When we praise him, it fills us with that power, that joy, the strength to know that he is good. And it turns our eyes away from all the stuff around us. And it is the best way to increase our joy is to share it with others. Oh my goodness, joy and laughter is contagious. Just as contagious as fear and anger, just more powerful. The joy and the laughter is such good medicine. Proverbs 17, 22, and I'll read it from the Amplified. A happy heart is good medicine, and a joyful mind causes healing, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. It is so good for us as believers to I think that's why Pastor Nathan starts, I didn't have any jokes today. I didn't pull a Nathan. I'm not good at puns and jokes. That's his thing. But I think that's why he starts the service that way, to get us filled with a little bit of joy, to laugh, even at his awful, awful jokes. It's cute because he wants us to laugh and to be joyful. Singing or shouting for joy is contagious too. When we're together and we worship and I'm up here singing and I hear someone, I, Rita has that war cry that I love. Darlene, you have your, when you're worshiping, when we hear others worship, it pulls on that river within us and it pulls and, then it, and there's this, this thing that happens and the joy rises and the praise rises together and it increases the joy for all of us. Psalms 95, one through three. I'm a worshiper. I've loved, that's like the first thing that I realized. We were down in, in Warrington, Missouri at that little church, and I was like, I want to praise. I was so, it was the first time I was going to lift my hands in a worship service. I'd been to some churches, and I'd kind of just been watching and checking it out. And I remember we were going, and I told I'm going to lift my hands, and I was so excited to lift my hands. And, we're, and just 
I just, there's nothing. There's nothing that can come close that this world has to offer. Sorry, honey, I love my husband, but it's not the same. There's a love that we have and a connection that we have with other humans, but it's not the same as being connected with our God. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Psalm 98, 4 through 6. Oh, I love the psalms. You ever, ever in a bad mood or just in a funk, go read some psalms. Read them out loud. That's what I found is if, if I'm... If I'm just like, if I can't concentrate, if I've read the same scripture three times, I start reading it out loud. It makes a difference. And I'm, I don't, it, it says by the hearing of the word, but it always surprises me what a big difference that makes for me. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of a psalm. With the trumpets and the sound of cornet, make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Just crank up some music. If you, can't, if you don't have a voice yourself, just listen. Just crank up some music. So why is it that joy is the first thing that goes when we start to worry, when we start to doubt, when we start to feel fear? Because that joy takes the wind out of our sails. When that joy goes, if there's no joy, there's no peace. If there's no peace, it's very hard to love one another. Because in that moment, we are very much in this world and no, no, no longer walking in the kingdom of God. And nothing closes the door on joy faster than fear. Darlene, you said it today. We prayed against that spirit of fear. Fear is the biggest tormentor that the enemy has against us. Deuteronomy 31, 8. Joshua is like my, probably one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament because... I have this all over my house, the, the scripture will read later, but, you know, be courageous. Be courageous. It takes courage to fight the temptation. It takes focus to fight that temptation. Anyway, uh, Deuteronomy 31.8 says, And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Don't be surprised. Don't be scared. Fear not. Isaiah 41, 10. How many times does the Bible tell us to fear not? That might be one of the things that Jesus said the most. I think fear not. Fear not. For I am with you. Be not dismayed. Don't be scared. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yea, I will help you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. And another translation says... Do not yield to fear, for I am always near. Never turn your gaze from me, for I am your faithful God. I will infuse you with my strength and help you in every situation. I will hold you firmly with my victorious right hand. I love that. And in those moments when fear starts to try to enter into our hearts and our minds, our very first instinct needs to be to run to the Lord and, into, and run into his presence. First Chronicles 16, 27. This is out of the Amplified, Michael. You don't have that one. Splendor and majesty are found in his presence. Strength and joy are found in his place, in his sanctuary. Where is his sanctuary? We are his sanctuary. First Peter 5, 7. Casting all of your care upon him, for he careth for you. We carry so much that we were never intended to carry. The worry, the fret, the, the doubt, the fear, the pain, the shame, the guilt from something behind, the worry for tomorrow. We were never intended to carry those things. We are to cast them upon him. And I'll never forget, we did a, an exercise. I don't remember if it was a Wednesday night or a women's group. Um, someone brought in a, I, I don't remember if it was with Joni maybe. We did a worry jar, right? We wrote down our biggest worries. We wrote them down, and then we tore them up, and we gave them to God. And we left them, and we were never, ever to pick them back up. And I'll never forget, my brother-in-law, Mike, his mom had a worry jar, and it was big. It was a, like a big crockery. And every day, for years and years and years, when she had a worry, she would write it down. And she would say, I trust you, Lord. And she would put it in there and not ever touch it again. It takes discipline to let it go and to keep letting it go because those worries, they come back, don't they? They don't come just once. They come back and they come back 
And it takes discipline to cast them aside, to cast them where they belong, to cast them to the place where he knows what tomorrow holds. He is the answer. He is our hope and our joy. And, of course, my favorite psalm, and a psalm that I don't know that I prayed every day, but it's called the Soldier's Psalm, Psalm 91. I know a lot of you have been praying Psalm 91 during this time during coronavirus. I'm going to read the whole psalm because it's, I think, so important. Every word in Psalm 91 is telling us how to stay safe, how to stay in his presence. What happens when we will choose to stay under his wing? Because that means I can't go fix it myself. If I'm choosing to trust in the Lord, I can't go fix it myself. You know, he'll give me the words to speak in those situations. And, 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 and you know the difference between making it happen and being led by the Spirit. We know that. At this point in our Christian lives, we know the difference. And I'm not saying that I always wait. <laughs> wait upon the Lord. That's not, not my strong suit, but it's, it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We shall live there. We shall make our home there. We shall go there. That's our place. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. I love watching all those movies with those big castles and the wars. and the, They are impenetrable fortresses. That's who our God is. He is an impenetrable fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Noisy pestilence. Doesn't that sound like whispers? Doesn't sound like that, the, the lies of the enemy? He's so noisy. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Shield and buckler before us and behind us. He's got our tomorrows and our yesterdays. All we have to do is stay in today and stay in the now. Thou shalt not be afraid. Do not fear for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in the darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. There's things out there that want to destroy us. There's things out there that want to kill us. But we don't have to worry about them. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand shall fall at thy right side. Our friends want to tell us and our family want to tell us how awful things are. They want to tell us their worries. They want to vent when they're angry. It's going to come, right? And we need to encourage them to go get under the shadow of the Almighty. We can't fix it for them, but He can. Only He can. But it shall not come nigh you. And this is you and your house. This coronavirus cannot come near us and our homes, our families. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, where I go to to find my rest, where I lay my head and peacefully sleep. If you don't have peace, your sleep is not very restful. And that's where your home is, right? Your habitation is where you can rest. That's what makes it a home because it's yours. It's where you're comfortable. It's where you can rest. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. We don't know what our God is doing every moment. That song that says, even when I can't see you, you're working. Even when I can't feel you, I know that you're there working. He is working it out for us. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the liar, right? The toothless lion. The young lion and the dragon shalt tr thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me. He has sealed me with his Holy Spirit. I am written on the palms of his hands. He knows the hairs on my head. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. His name is Jesus. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble. And I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Thank you, Jesus. With long life shall I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Friends, when we choose to make the Lord our habitation and our dwelling place, 
that is the only way we're going to be able to resist the pull of this world. The pull of yesterday and the pull of tomorrow. Do you know what he did? Can you believe what he did? Can you believe this happened and that happened? And this person said this and this person did that. And we want to fix it, right? We want to fix it. We want to make it better. We pray. We trust that the Lord will give everybody wisdom and encourage people to pray. It's so hard. Oh, ladies, I don't know about you, but my girlfriends, they like to, ooh, the hens like to talk. And troubles come, but then the troubles go. And then the troubles come, and then the troubles go. But if we will resist the devil, he will flee. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit ourselves to God. Resist the devil, the temptation to worry, the temptation to step out of our connected new place and into this world to get dirty in the dirt and try and fix it ourselves. Choose not to give in to worry or fear over what might happen or what might not happen or what could happen or what should happen a moment from now or tomorrow. Matthew 6:34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. It is evil to think and worry about what is never going to happen. We imagine so many outcomes that never happen. And it steals our joy. It steals our ability to see through the eyes of the Spirit and speak powerfully from the kingdom of God. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything. Be careful for nothing. Be careful for nothing. I think that we're supposed to cast our cares, right? We're supposed to cast our cares. We don't carry our cares. I don't know what that means, but that just struck me. Uh, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. The battlefield is our minds. It is our minds. It is our imagination and our minds because what we think is what we say. And I'm telling you, I just, the, the, the crazier this world gets, the more discipline it's going to take to not get pulled into it because it is getting ridiculous out there. Choose to let go of past hurts. Regrets and shame. Relationships are so stinking difficult. If it was just me and the Lord, it'd be a, just a breeze to get through this life. Be lonely, but boy, would it be simple. <laughs> but people are complicated. Human beings. We have our moments. We have our, our, our wonderful aspects and our not so wonderful aspects. We are complicated creatures. And being in relationship with us is the hardest part of being human and living this life. And people hurt us, right? Things happen, something is said. But when we choose to walk forward in forgiveness, choosing to walk forward in forgiveness is much easier if we can let go of the things that happen behind. It is sometimes very hard for some very deep, real hurts that happened in the past. God alone can heal those. But when we choose to let go of the past, really let go of it, that's when God can heal it and touch the deepest places of our heart. And forgiveness is what sets us free to live in the now. Otherwise, a part of our heart is always stuck in the past. And we can't ever 100% be truly present until all of those places are healed. Forgiveness, unforgiveness, holds us back. Ephesians 4.32 And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. It's very hard when somebody hurts you to be like, well, 70 times 7, Lord. Is it 70 times 71 because I'm about done, right? Having healthy boundaries is one thing. Having real forgiveness is another. So that's all I'll say about that. Philippians 3, 13 through 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forward unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If I'm letting go of everything behind and I'm, and I'm turned and I'm focused on pressing toward something, if I'm, what we look for, we find. What we're searching for, we always apprehend. 
right? If, if, I, if I have a victim mentality and I feel like I'm always the victim, then I'm always going to see that I'm the victim. Every situation, I'm going to be the victim. I'm, gonna, I'm always going to be the victim. But if I'm the overcomer and I am the one that, that just lets it and overcome, then I will overcome. What I see from my perspective is how I'm going to look at the situation. It's how I'm going to speak. It's how I'm going to position myself. And that's how my mind is trained to think. And if I'm pressing forward, I think of athletes, right? Athletes, when they're working towards a goal, every moment of every day is focused. Today, right now, they're visualizing, they're working, they're doing all these things, right? It's that pressing forward, right, for the prize. Our prize is Jesus Christ, is to be more like him. It's less of us, more of him, to be more aware of who he is in us so that we don't have to deal with as much of ourselves. We all have our junk. But the more we can connect with him, the less aware and the less loud the voice of our humanity becomes. And the easier it is to hear and to tune in, right? It's that transistor radio where you're tuning it in. And it's staticky sometimes. Or we have a, we have a, a dish now. And boy, when we get bad weather, good luck. You're watching a DVD. It's the, you know, when the weather changes, we don't have to worry about losing our signal anymore. Because by the time we're in those situations, it's too late to establish a good connection. It's too late. And when I think about our choices and how we react in each moment, I've always thought of it as a fork in the road, right? I always kind of think of like Wizard of Oz and the Yellow Brick Road, and there's like a fork in the road. But really, the Lord took me to Joshua, and we're on the banks of the Jordan River, right? And we're, we're, we're on this side, and, and, and Joshua is saying, let's go. Let's go. We can take the promised land. It's time. We can take the promised land. But there's giants over there. There's giants over there, right? It took a whole generation to find those who'd have faith. And so now we're standing on the bank of the River Jordan. We have to choose. Are we going to stay on the side of the Egypt in this world, in our humanity, in our flesh? Or do we have the faith and the courage to choose to cross over into the promised land, the kingdom of God, even if there's giants in the land? Joshua 1.9. And this is my favorite scripture. I have this all over my house, etched in wood and whatever on canvases. Every time I see it, I buy it because it's my favorite scripture. Have not I commanded thee? I've, pr I've told you. I've given you an order. Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee wherever you go. Everywhere you go, he is with you. Be strong. Be courage. Be of good courage. Do not be afraid. Joshua is the son of Nun. In the Greek, guess what the word is for now? Nun, N-U-N. That was a special gift for me, I think. And the Lord gives you those little moments. Nun doesn't mean now in the Hebrew, but in Greek, the word for now, Strong's G3562, is Nun, N-U-N. The now. He was the son of right now. He was the son of right now. Let's do it now. God said he was ready to go. When they came back from the spies, when they had searched out, he's like, we can take it. We are, we are well able to take the land right now. There was, well, no, there's giants. And how else do you get the houses you didn't build? How else do you get to eat from the vineyards you didn't plant? You have to have courage and be strong right now. Hebrews 13.6. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. There is nothing that this world can hold a candle to compared to what Jesus Christ has done for us and given to us. So I tell you today, be strong and courageous, live in the now, then you too will be able to count it all joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You are dismissed in Jesus' name. We'll see everyone next week. Pastor Nathan will be back next week, so be blessed.